Good. So we'll we'll start, and uh, I'll start with a quick uh, welcome and thank you. You know, on behalf of the, the, the three centers organizing this uh, this event. So we're really pleased to have uh, several speakers today. Uh, first one is uh, Anderson uh, Roca from uh, Unicamp in uh, in Brazil, uh, who's finishing a six month uh, sabbatical at IDIAP in, uh, in in Martinique. So Anderson is a is a full professor of uh, artificial intelligence and digital uh, forensics and the director of the Artificial Intelligence Lab, Recode AI, uh, at, uh, at uh, Unicamp. And it's one of the, oh, the largest uh, AI lab in uh, Latin America. So uh, as you saw, today's topic um, is about so-called synthetic realities, um, or how, to, how generative AI technologies can mimic what we see, hear, um, and, and, and read. And more, more importantly, what this means for information, for knowledge, uh, for, for, for trust and, uh, and society. It's, uh, it's a pressing issue for the scientific community and also for, 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 for media, but also policymakers. And one that the three centers organizing this, this event, so namely CIS, C4DT and uh, EMI have in common and, and we're of course uh, really concerned about, the, about these issues. So we'll start uh, in a few seconds so with uh, Anderson's uh, presentation, and then we will have the pleasure to, to, to also listen to Turaj Ebrahimi, so who's among other things, the, the head of the Multimedia Signal Processing Group here uh, at EPFL. And the discussion will be moderated by Gilles Labart, uh, sitting in front of me here, who, who works both as a researcher and a journalist. So of course the, the discussion is, is really meant to be interactive. So you, you will have your you know, uh, chance to, to ask questions. So please participate to, to this discussion. And well, I thank you all for, you know, for being here. Thank you to the speakers also for, the, you know, for coming here and uh, sharing their, their uh, current work. And please, thank the you. is yours. Thank you. thank you. So hello everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. At the end of this talk, I hope that you have uh, a clear idea of the problems that we are dealing with and possible ways that we have to address or at least to um, diminish the, the, these problems, okay? So um, just to put in context, I I'm with this uh, lab called Record AI. I'm a professor for AI and digital forensics there. Um, and the, um, the objective of this talk today is one of the key areas of investigations that we have in the lab, which is trust. So currently I am at EDAP uh, to establish some partnerships. And as I am here, I was looking uh, for uh, possible places to uh, discuss uh, and start new collaborations. And I came across uh, Professor Turaj and he kindly accepted uh, to be with me here and to invite me for, for this talk. So have, like all of a sudden, we have this sensation that everything is happening everywhere at uh, the same time, right? And this feeling is not just about artificial intelligence, it's also about new things in biotech, uh, in IoT, uh, in robotics, and nanotech. So these five things together, these five technologies, they create what we are calling convergence revolution. And specifically, one that we know and we hear a lot is AI. And everyone is talking about AI. Some fearing uh, some future that's going to be dystopic. Others uh, proclaiming that we are going to be replaced in a nice way. Uh, and uh, we're going to be like just relegated uh, as second species. But we have many good uses of AI. And I'm sure that you heard of some of them, like in cancer screening, new forms of detection, new forms of medications, vaccines. One example, a very nice example indeed, was from Moderna recently for SARS-CoV-2 virus. That vaccine was discovered using biotech and AI. And it was discovered in less than three weeks. So they needed to find the specific edit spaces, edit spots in the messenger RNA and how they did it using AI algorithms. In less than three weeks, they found the spots and they could inactivate the spike protein of the virus. And then, of course, we had like eight, nine months to 
uh, do the trials, but the vaccine was discovered in three weeks. We have protein folding. I'm sure you heard of this new citizen in town called AlphaFold. Uh, we have uh, research for wildlife conservation, even for saving the bees. And in my, my own lab, we are developing some research for health and well-being based on biosensors, like looking what's happening in our body using like um, smart watches. And then based uh, in these biosensors, we can, for instance, anticipate problems with the concentration of glucoses because we look at the concentration at the viscosity of the blood and we measure that with uh, light and these light sensors is they are in the watch so we can do those kind of things and it's very nice we can improve production of food uh, and uh, have more food per square kilometer planted we are developing some research to fight climate change and to decrease uh, poverty and inequality. So we all know now important applications of AI and why it's delivering. So why everybody's talking about? Because we have, for the first time in history, actually many applications that are translated to the industry and resulting in solving problems and resulting in profits. But then, of course, we had the bad things. So we're talking, we're talking about the good. We have the bad. And the bad, some people fear, like in how 9000, 2001 Space Odyssey, that we are going to be replaced. And uh, we're going to be, we're going to have like an intelligence explosion and we are going to be left behind. Or that we're going to have some scenario of ex machina in, in which we are going to just be around doing nothing. So I don't advocate this. I don't think that we are in that direction. I really think that uh, we might have several problems with AI regarding privacy, copyright infringement, uh, biases, prejudices, and many other things, labor implications. But I don't fear that we are going to be just replaced by machines. So that's why I call this the bad thing, because it's a bad perception of what's happening. And this is because people typically, according to R2C Clark, people uh, think that sufficiently advanced technology, they are not distinguishable from magic. So when people don't understand, they just think it's magic. Imagine people in America when they saw the, the Spanish folks for the first time with horses. They never saw horses before. So for them, the horses were like something magical. And for people that I talk with uh, uh, daily, uh, people that are not used to technology, they think that the things that we do are magic. Some people even treat me as a magician because I'm doing things with the computer that they don't understand. But this is just magic for them. It's not. It's math. So the really ugly thing about what's going on nowadays is a factory of fake news. And this impacts the whole society because society has some pillars and one of the most important pillars of society is trust. So if you don't trust your neighbor, if, you're don't, if you don't trust your institutions, if you don't trust your companies, there is no transactions, there is no way that you can survive without fighting for everything. And the problem is that, according to this study of Daniel Kahneman uh, some years ago, um, and he won uh, basically the Nobel Prize of Economy uh, out of this research, is that we typically... Um, believe what we see, what we hear, what we have access to. So what you see is how there is. So we have basically in our brains two systems, one and two. System one is very quick and reactive. It uses like just a few calories, just a few energy to do things. And it's, we have also system two, which is like slower, but critic. So it has a lot of energy to spend. So most of the times when we see things, when we hear things, we are in the automatic. We are just using our reaction system. So system one, fast, but cheap. 
And this is what happens when you open a web page and you see a fake content. And you don't even stop to question if it's that real uh, or not. But what we need to do is to question, to be critics. And what I want to show you today is what's happening when you don't do that. So that's how comes to play the field of digital forensics. So digital forensics is basically the set of techniques that we develop that goes from the collection of evidence, preserving, validating, identifying, analyzing, and interpreting this evidence to help us in some legal cases. Okay. And it goes, it has the roots on this premise of Edmund Locker. Ever contact leaves a trace. So if you go to Photoshop and you falsify some document, if you synthesize with AI some uh, media, uh, it will leave a trace, at least until now. So what's happening now from now on is that these algorithms are becoming so good that the question is what's next? So to give you an idea of where we are, so here's some history. Some 15, 20 years ago, the major problem that we had was like separating fake images from normal images, like photographs. And we could use a lot of hints to do that. So this is like the hurt of digital forensics. So basically we were having like a, a classification problem. And I'm going to show you some of the ways that we use it to do this, like uh, illumination inconsistencies, compression inconsistencies, like JPEG, JPEG blocking, we could use that, acquisition inconsistencies, all of those. And we were happy and didn't know. Then we also have problems uh, with people uh, hiding information in other media, like images hidden in other images. We had real cases like in Brazil, for instance, and US, of arrested people that had um, messages hidden in images. One famous case is of like a, one of the most um, wanted drug dealers in Colombia. He was arrested in the Sao Paulo airport some years ago. And when police looked at his notebook, his laptop, he had like 150 images of Hello Kitty, the Japanese tractor. So think about this. It's like a Colombian drug dealer, one of the most wanted guys in the world, and he has like 150 images of a locate in his computer. Something's wrong. Mm -hmm. So when they analyzed it more carefully, the, those images, they found some messages hidden uh, in the images, uh, some small MP3 files that uh, he was using to send to these uh, fellows and with like orders of assassination and things like that. And the uh, Federal Police of Brazil and FBI, they could retrieve some of these messages, but not because they had the technology for it, because this guy was so smart that he left the software that he, he used to hide things in his computer. Uh, then some years ago, we also had this problem of identifying what was computer generated and what was a photograph. And there was no AI. So basically, it was like a software in computer graphics that used it to do this. And we knew that we had several problems, especially regarding hair and fur and mouth and eyes, regions of rich, rich um, context that these algorithms could not deal well uh, at the time. But now it's different. We also had problems identifying the source of an image if it was like coming from a, a specific camera or a specific device. We also had problems regarding provenance. So given an image, uh, can you trace the origin of this image? So this is called phylo phylogeny. So it has something to do in, uh, in biology. And the fact is we, uh, we have always relied on what we call artifacts to detect these kind of things. And these artifacts could be related to the acquisition. So I, I know that if I take a photograph, it's going to have some pattern that's uh, uh, built in in that camera. The, the noise is going to be related to that camera in particular. The compression parameters of that camera will be or might be different from other cameras, depending on the firmware and the model of the camera. So we could use that. Or we could use the illumination analysis. So, so if you put a person that's like in a sunny day side by side with another person that came from like a, a place like this indoors, the, the lighting does not match. So it was really hard for a person to go to Photoshop and try to match the illumination. So we could use all of this to identify these forgeries. And basically we had like a, here I have a basic 
pipeline of what, what happens. Suppose that you have light coming in and you want to take a photograph of this tree. So the light will go to the lenses of a camera where you have like some exposition, stabilization, then for some, through some filters. And then um, because in the past, because of like cost, um, normally we didn't have each point of a camera was not capturing the three basic colors are neighbors to uh, uh, infer the other colors. So this is called um, color filter array. Then it goes to the processing unit and then you have the resulting photograph. If we're talking about forensics, normally we focus on these two red areas here. And uh, the mosaicing process for uh, cost reasons is something like this. Suppose that you want to infer that point in red. So you want to know the blue and the, the green in there. So you just look for the neighbors that you have. So each, each uh, maker will have its own way of doing that. It, it, the, the more processing power you have, you can use more neighbors. You can use like better algorithms to combine these neighbors. So it goes like, this guy is the limit if you have processing power. And, and we could use this kind of combination to separate off what was real from what was fake. So if someone like puts a tree in this, in this image here side, side by side with the house, then if it has a different neighboring pattern, it would be like um, different from this house. So it could identify this discrepancy. Okay. So as I said, we were happy and didn't know. Then we can, we can also use this as JPEG also divides the image in grids of eight by eight, at least in the standard way of uh, compression. We could also use this because when you put a piece of image on, onto another, the gridding is going to be different. So you have some inconsistency in terms of compression. So everything uh, could be done using this. So we have some cases here, a uh, famous one that went to, to newspapers. We recently had in the Ukrainian war. Uh, all of these we call the structural artifacts. It's pixel repetition, interpolation, compression, misalignment, lots of this. Here's an example. We can look for a specific place that was modified in the past, like 20 years ago, even lexicographical order of the pixels could help us. Then we improved that detecting uh, regions of the image that were resistant or more robust to compression, scale, rotation, elimination. Uh, and then it was used to help us detect forgeries. And we also improved that doing analysis in multiple scales of the image and it helped us to improve the detection of them. But then came 2018, and everything changes. And why? Because we have a new person in town and lots of noise. So now we have what we're calling the era of synthetic reality. What is synthetic reality? Before this, we use it to have like fakes independent. One object here is a fake. This image here is a fake. This document here is a fake. It's independent. There, there was no context normally. But now we have. And we define synthetic reality as the combination of AI-driven synthetic media. It might be audio, image, text, video, doesn't matter. Sometimes some of them combine it. Then it comes with context. And then there is a narrative. So when you put together a narrative, a context, AI-driven synthetic media and our brains, mainly activating just system one, which is lazy and does not make questions, then people tend to believe what they see, what they hear, what they experience. And this is possible to be done because now we have data as ever before. Never before we had so much data available, so much processing power, and so many people working in developing techniques. So lots of researchers, doing AI, lots of data, lots of computer power. So I'm going to show you some examples of what we can do. And, and just the audio is not that important, but think about here. We want to see, we are going to see some examples of these realities. Of glass domes. The audio is not important here. Let me show you this one. Like this input, you would never imagine that it will generate something like this. So think about this one. It's a very simple image in terms of like, I. It doesn't want to like deceive anyone, but look at the level of processing of language. 
The prompt is Call of Duty first person shooter in a Titian painting. So it's a lot of concepts that the algorithm needs to grasp with. Like, first, what is a Titian painting? So for those of you who likes art, like, like I do, it's a great painter from uh, 1500s, 1600s, like uh, the, uh, in Portuguese is Renascimento, um, Italian. So a very nice way of painting. And the algorithm would need to see the style of this painter and translate it to the new image. Then it would be, it would need to be in the first person. So the concept of being first person would need to be understood. And it needs to be something like a shooter. So put everything together and it generates something like this. And if you look at some paintings of Titian, it's gonna be, at least some of the details will be similar. And here's another one. Probably you have seen this one before. This was a competition in Colorado last year. And uh, it's called the Theater de l'Opera Spatiale. Um, my French is very bad. But uh, in English, it would be the Theater of Spatial Opera by Jason Allen. And this guy is the artist behind this image. And it was created with 800 iterations with Midjourney and 800 prompts, adaptations. And then the result is this, and it looks nice, at least for me, when I look at this, uh, the high resolution version of this, it's a complicated piece. And if this guy decided to print it in, 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 uh, with a very high end printer, it would be believable, right? So this is what he did and he won the context. And here's another example, this one more in terms of like can be used in politics and it's being used a lot. Here is an example of uh, what we call deep fake. So when you impersonate a person uh, in terms of audio, in terms of visual, in the video itself. So this example here was done like three years ago. Now it's not even the state of the art anymore, but you're gonna see the result. I am not Morgan Freeman. What you see is not real. Well, at least in contemporary terms, it is not. What if I were to tell you that I'm not even a human being? Would you believe me? What is your perception of reality? Is it the ability to capture, process, and make sense of the information our senses receive? If you can see, hear, taste, or smell something, does that make it real? Or is it simply the ability to feel? I would like to welcome you to the era of synthetic reality. Now, what do you see? So it was created to show you the power of things that you can puppet. It's like a puppet, a puppeteer. You can control the way people talk. You can control the way that they move. So imagine if you use this in like large scale and we are having that. We have that nowadays in some countries, Brazil is one, uh, mainly in the election, uh, elections. Uh, in Brazil now, we, we say that according to some analysis, 80% of these cases, and it's a lot of cases, are related to pornography. So putting people's faces on, uh, on the bodies of others. Some 10, 15% politics. And then revenge porn. A couple disagree with, they argue, they break up, and then one of them decides to release images of the other uh, using like a, as a revenge. And then we also have for child porn. So people are using this for child pornography. So it's a serious problem. Here's another example so that when the next time that you see an image, question yourself, is it real? Think about this. This one was released some like one or one and a half months ago. And it's like the easy of a click.
Will you believe an image when you see it again? You can control everything. It's like uh, we have this uh, uh, in Brazil. It's like a, a small uh, ball that you can mold as you want for children. It's like these people, these algorithms nowadays, they are like dealing with images, like molding. Play-Doh. Yeah, you can do it easily based on the data available. And ChatGPT is the same for text. So you can do that. You can generate narratives the way you want. You can pretend to be other people. You can edit images like this. And it's like, it generates the image. So all of these make us ask, am I real? When I see an image, is it real? So this is serious. Why? Because again, we have the feeling that everything is happening everywhere all at once. And we cannot and should not think that this is magic. We don't want the return of magicians. We want people to be critics. So what can we do? We can develop techniques and technological advancement is very important. And one of the directions that my group is doing is like investigating different detectors because there is no way one detector might be enough. So we work on the math part of combining different outputs or we can develop some of them to detect some uh, inconsistencies. And uh, one of the state-of-the-art detectors of deepfakes now, we developed it in partnership with Hong Kong, is based on semantics and noise acquisition telltales, like this. So this is an example. Uh, you can see that now, okay, because this is a cat and mouse game, now we can detect it, but it's possible that these algorithms will improve their generation and then our, they will break our algorithm. You can see that in the regions of mouth and eyes, for normal images, the one on the left, uh, you have more signature. You have like a, uh, it's a richer region of details. Uh, look at the left one, the, the last one. It's a very poor in terms of like uh, noise uh, features. And it's like the algorithm called neural textures. But of course, these guys will improve. So you cannot just rely on detectors. You need other things. So here's another example of our results. So when you give like a totally generated image, everything is going to be activated because it's a fake. Uh, when it's a real image, nothing is going to be activated because it's a photograph. And then if you just edit some parts, it's going to activate the part that was uh, modified. So what's the, pers the perspective that we have? We have a much more difficult problem that we had 20 years ago. And the speed of change is unprecedented. We need cooperation of different groups. And one of the reasons that I'm here today is to show you, to make you aware of what's happening and also to entice to rise to collaborate in some part. Another thing is we have an open set nature problem. What is this? You cannot develop a detector assuming that you know all the generators and people are doing that in the literature. Oh, I have these 10 different ways of generating fakes. I'm gonna train with the 10. Does it work? Because in reality, people can use any other thing. So what we try to do, we try to model these detectors without knowing what's going to be in terms of generators. And these guys can be combined to spoof even biometric systems. When you try to log in into your phone, you can use this guy, a synthetic, to log into the phone of another person. How can you detect it? So we, at least in our group, if you want to develop techniques, you need to also use AI. This is for sure. So this is what we are doing. Because the telltales will be even more difficult from time to time. We need to use complementary methods. And then we have the actions. So from my experience, I'm proposing four actions that we need to have. So the first one, you need standards. One example is JPEG. So when you have like the, the generators, uh, they will use these mediums. Somehow, if you are producing an image, you need a median. So how are you going to save? So if you use JPEG to save the median that you generate, we can work in the details in the standardization of this median to have it give us some control of what's going, of, of what's going on. So if a newspaper publishes some images, we have some control if it's real or not. Of course, a criminal will not use this. But then in that case, you can use the detectors. Then we need also regulation. So it cannot be a bad regulation, the one that's not smart, so to say, but you need to discuss some regulation. Uh, 
in the beginning, it does not need to be like an overarching regulation that regulates everything. It can be for a specific problems, but you need it. You need technological literacy. People need to know what's going on. People need to know that we have this kind of, uh, of problems. Children need to know that they might look at things that are not real. You probably have heard of the problem called grooming. So I don't know if in Switzerland it's a real problem, but in Brazil, US, it's a real problem. Grooming is when an adult tries to deceive a child to do things he or she wants. So in the past, grooming was based on like a, a, an adult would uh, threaten the child not to tell anyone. But now the adult pretends to be someone else. So the adult has a Zoom conversation with a child pretending to be Donald Duck. And as Donald Duck, the adult asks the child to do things and she will do it because she likes Donald Duck and she believes that she's talking to Donald Duck. And uh, here I'm exaggerating as a character, but it might be someone that the child knows and trusts. It, may, it can be an uncle or uh, an uncle or an aunt or another person, okay? So this is grooming to the next level. How can we detect it? And finally, we need the technological solutions. And in our group, we try to work mainly developing the solutions, working with the literacy, proposing some regulations with the government. And until now, I didn't work yet with the standardization, but here you have one person that works with it. So when we get together these things, we might have one, one way forward. Because if we don't, we are gonna threaten the three pillars of so society. First is democracy. If there is no trust, there is no democracy. If every person can create its own reality, there is no reality because each person will believe, we trust its own reality. So if I trust one thing, you trust another thing, another person trusts another thing, what's real? So that's a problem. And we've seen that already in a small scale for elections, for the Brexit, and for Bolsonaro in Brazil, for Trump in the US. And then we also have the problem of individual freedom. So when you don't have trust, you don't have individual freedom. And you also have a problem with social tolerance. People don't tolerate each other. So this is what I want. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Rocca, for all these informations. Very precious to have a, such you. a specialist on, on this uh, topic. Uh, I have a lot of questions. I'm sure the floor has uh, as well. You did uh, also already answer to some of them in your, your presentation. And I wanted just to, to highlight one point uh, that is in your one of your last papers, the age of synthetic realities, challenges and opportunity, opportunities. Uh, I just want to quote this. Uh, uh, it's a quote. Around 90% of digital content will be synthetic in the upcoming years. Uh, I think this is uh, well, a way of, uh, well, uh, talking about the challenge uh, ahead. Um, first, I, I wanted to ask uh, one question related to, to um, well, information of public interest and newspapers uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, one of the, well, the well, most important challenges nowadays with this uh, uh, AI uh, which with the change, uh, well, I don't, what is printed? Uh, and I'll ask the same question for Switzerland to, to uh, arrange. The main thing that changes is the amount of information, right? So when you have much more information, how do you check the facts? So uh, for us in Brazil, we have like a three or four big uh, collaborations with journalists uh, in the country now uh, that try to do fact checking, but fact checking is expensive. So they can go uh, as far as checking like a few dozen cases, but what happens? It died. <laughs> <laughs> what happens uh, with the other cases that you cannot check? So this, this is something very difficult to do, and that's why I try to say that we need to activate our critical uh, inner self 
to don't believe everything that we read that we have access to. Okay. So uh, I think that um, the challenge from now on, as you mentioned, 90% of the content will be synthetic is you need to have some set of rules. So where do you read your news? Is it reliable? Who is the journalist? Is, him, uh, uh, is he or she reliable? Uh, is the, that piece of news so spectacular? Because guys, when you see something that claims spectacular things, Ask yourself, yeah, something is wrong about this because things do not need to be that spectacular. Like um, we had uh, last week uh, an event in Geneva and uh, Sophia, the robot, just said something like, uh, I could rule the world, I could uh, govern the world better than humans. Of course, this is just a repetition, it's chat GPT. But then people see that and they think, wow, the robots are saying that they can govern the world much better than we do. This is a spectacularization, right? It's impossible to have that. It's a, something that is like apparent. So I think that the challenge is activating our system too, being critic. Okay, same question for Switzerland. So, you know, um, so the question is, if I understand, what is the impact of AI, especially in the trees context, mm, and especially for uh, media and journalistic uh, communities? Uh, so, you know, Switzerland, of course, is part of the world. <laughs> so uh, some of the challenges we have in Switzerland is going to be the same as everywhere else, including in, in Brazil. But uh, Switzerland has a number of particularities. Uh, one of them is that actually some believe, and I'm one of them, that Switzerland is actually known in the world as the country of trust, right? So trust actually is really in the DNA of Switzerland. You take any country in the world, um, they also have the uh, trust uh, in their DNA, but I think it's very, very strong in Switzerland. The other thing that uh, distinguishes Switzerland from Brazil, for example, the United States, you mentioned several times, is that the population of Switzerland is hardly over 8 million people. That's not even a city in Brazil. And I guess you are over 100 million now, right? 200. 200. <laughs> so, so, you know, the scale is very, very different. So we are really a very small village. Now in that small village where trust has been a little bit easier to deal with because it's smaller and it's because of the size, it's more manageable. Um, we are in Switzerland much more um, impacted by any trust issues that AI can bring because we are a little bit less used to it, right? Our politicians, they don't fight or, uh, you know, they don't do things that uh, some other places do. We are not used to that. And since the, 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 the place is very small, uh, the word of mouth and the discussions, etc., cetera, they, they have much easier way to, to circulate in a, in a small circle. And if one of these um, entities, let's say a, nor a, a journal uh, that we trust, the Swiss TV, the Swiss radio, some of the, the newspapers, they, uh, they really lose the trust that people have on them. It's going to have far more impact because of the scale, right? Uh, they say trust takes years, if not decades to build, build and it takes seconds to lose, right? So because of that, in Switzerland, we are, we are really probably much more sensitive to the issue of trust. And our reaction also is a little bit uh, different. And I wanna give uh, one example, which is very Swiss, uh, although probably it has been also uh, discussed elsewhere in Switzerland. Uh, one of our newspaper, the good newspaper, I personally also uh, um, look at, I'm not gonna uh, go to give the name of the newspaper, it's mainly online. They decided, they decided, in order to fight the problem of synthetic media using AI, because of uh, Midjourney, Dali, and a few other um, uh, stable diffusion, et cetera, uh, apps that are around that people can create all sorts of content, they decided to make a chart and say they will never use any synthetic content. Now, let's think of, of the content as pictures, okay? We saw some examples. 
let me give you an uh, so your I think your 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 prediction is very correct. Then. Probably eighty percent of all content is going to be AI generated, either partially or fully. But I have a news for you: every single picture you have ever taken since digital picture exists, two thirds of their pixels are synthetic. Actually. Uh, the mosaicing part. Anderson just showed it, right? So your sensor has one third of the pixels. And what you, when you take a picture, two thirds is generated by an algorithm. You could call it AI based or not, doesn't matter. But two thirds is created, it is existing. I'm not even counting the numerous type of processing that happens change of contrast, change of uh, uh, reducing the noise, a lot of things change, right? So a solution that paints with a large brush, the entire world of synthetic media, whether it is generated by AI or not, it's not gonna work because then you cannot put any image. If you use any camera, like it or not, it's gonna do this. Two thirds of the pixels are going to be generated. We cannot do that. So these are the dangers. Now, um, I, I don't wanna make it long, but um, I think it's very, very important that whatever solution, and we don't have it today, whatever solution we're going to have has to be done smart in a smart way and have all the actors, all the stakeholders really around the table to look at it from different perspectives. So from a journalistic perspective, it's true. That well, something is synthetic, but it's probably not true, or at least danger of not, it not being true is large. But don't forget the realities also, right? So the realities are that a lot of content is synthetic, at least visually, and even in audio, it's the same. Oh. Uh, I read in another uh, article uh, about, uh, is it correct to talk about artificial intelligence is not misleading? I mean, uh, should we call it differently? I used to make this question to my students. Um, what we have today is not intelligence nor artificial. <laughs> So um, it's a name, perhaps a uh, misnomer. Um, it was basically a dispute in the 50s of people researching uh, one area called cybernetics and the other front was doing something different and they call it AI. Uh, but um, the important thing that we should think of is, is it really intelligence? How do we define intelligence? It's a very open term, right? So uh, in my group and uh, some others that I collaborate with, we have the pragmatic definition of AI. And the pragmatic definition of AI is any software, any algorithm that goes to the word, senses the word, get the data, process that data, learn from it, store it in a form of knowledge, use this knowledge to take decisions, act upon the word, and adapt over time. This is pragmatic. And the same we do for machine learning. What is machine learning? You have a problem, it's a, you need to solve it, and you design a software to do that. How do you define that this software has machine learning? You have data, you have an algorithm that we work with this data. The more data that you see, according to a specific metric of success, you improve this metric over time. For us, this is like a pragmatic definition of machine learning. So there is no consciousness discussion, self-consciousness, consciousness. There, not, there is no discussion of intelligence because intelligence might, might be much more complex, okay? So if you consider AI as this, you can do great things. You can solve really the problems that we have, like a climate, you can look for medicines, you can look for vaccines. This is the kind of problem that we need to, to focus on and the impact on society, labor, biases, prejudices and everything. But then if you really think that you can have something intelligent by definition, then you open the discussion to much more problems, many more problems, like are we going to be replaced? 
I, I really don't believe so. We are far away from that. But the, the new question, what happens in 500 years? I, I have no idea. We might even decide not to use AI anymore. We might be like uh, uh, happy with the way of life that we have without technology. It might be, we don't know. But uh, for us, AI should be read as augmented intelligence. The same that you have with your phone, the same that you have um, if other things in, in your day-to-day -day, uh, actions. Uh, it's just uh, another tool or set of tools to help us solve problems, at least for, for me. Yeah, so I, I really like your question and I really appreciate that you ask it because mm -hmm. listen, uh, I think that the world of artificial intelligence has been really polluted, not necessarily in a wrong way, because of Hollywood, okay? okay. Hollywood makes a lot of movies and as humans, we really love to be scared. So a lot of these movies put artificial intelligence and they use that word for it under a scope where they take over the world or they go to future of the past and they do all sorts of uh, nasty things. And they're very entertaining, they're very great, but then we get biased by that, right? If I told you that linear or nonlinear regression is going to take over the world. You're gonna laugh. If I tell you Bayesian networks are gonna take over the world, you're gonna laugh. But maybe you would say, yeah, but these are geeky words, of course. It makes a laugh because you're using geeky word, words. Well, what if I told you smart systems are gonna take the, over the world? It doesn't have the same impact. As if I told you, artificial intelligence is going to take over. So you know, it works. Even smart versus intelligent can have a very, very big impact. And uh, I, I fully agree with Anderson that uh, that uh, you know, be, let's be careful. The intelligence used in artificial intelligence, as people call it in the in the field, uh, and the intelligence of humans are not really the same, right? They are not really the same. They are fundamentally different. And, um, and uh, this distinction uh, is, is lost a little bit too much. And we see artificial intelligence and the intelligence beyond artificial intelligence sharing a lot of things that human intelligence has. As humans, we, are, we have a mission. Well, that's, that's part of being human, right? The human that doesn't have ambi ambitious goals doesn't even exist. A machine does not necessarily have ambition. You have emotions. Machines, they can mimic emotion in order to add, interact better with us, but they don't really have the same type of emotion that we have, right? And this long, list is long. So the artificial intelligence, the intelligence in artificial intelligence is not the same as the intelligence in humans. And this distinction, unfortunately, is often lost. We saw some slides also about AI for good and there were was a conference in Geneva a few months ago uh, from uh, ITIU about this, uh, how, how, how to use uh, AI for uh, 17 uh, sustainable development goals, for example. So there's uh, also uh, solutions and, uh, and good uh, applications. Uh, I wanted to quote another thing. Uh, on the, one other slide, uh, we saw together uh, artificial intelligence and social networks. And there's a, there's a quote on, your, on page 16 of your, your contribution. Trust plays a fundamental role in our society. Citizens and trust infrastructures, services, including education and health, media, including social networks nowadays. Uh, could we talk a little bit more about the main actors of AI? and how it is linked, in fact, to social networks. Well, this is a very important question because when you think about innovation, you need more people working towards innovation, right? Um, and what's happening with AI now is that we are having a concentration of a few actors that are really capable of uh, doing big, large, very large experiments. And it might be a problem. So you might we we used to have uh, what's called the big nine, 
and there is even a book about about this called the big nine and uh, if i'm not mistaken it would be like six uh, american companies and three from china uh, and they basically govern like 75 80 percent of everything that's in ai nowadays um, and these companies they are becoming so large indeed one of them just became a trillion a three trillion dollar company like a one or two weeks ago i hope right they that they are bigger than countries imagine uh, it's very likely that apple is bigger than many countries nowadays in terms of uh, economic power and uh, even in the number of engineers they might have more engineers than many countries so they concentrate power they concentrate decisions of what they want to do these solutions they develop it's closed even though some companies are called open ai they are closed um, and they are um, pushing for um, their kind of uh, decisions. So for instance, uh, one or two months ago, we were voting the fake news act in Brazil. And it would like, um, it would be important to mostly force these social networks to take down some notices. Like uh, if they see that a piece of news is harming another person and it's shown to be a fake, they would be forced to take it down in like in 24 hours at most. Uh, before the vote, they were so fiercely against it that any kind of search that you would do in Google, they put a logo below the, the search box saying that that kind of legislation would be bad for the country. So now uh, there is a, uh, an investigation and they might, uh, it might be like a transformed to a big fine against Google and they are going to vote the law anyhow, but you can see that as far as they go. Um, Sam Altman from OpenAI, for instance, uh, met many European leaders to force them to make changes to the EU AI Act and definitely he will make them change something because it's like a big company that we're not talking about open AI anymore, we're talking about Microsoft and with Microsoft there are others. So what's the role of social media? Social media is like the mine. So it's where you get the data, right? Uh, in the past, we had the gold mines and people went there and they came out all of uh, all black with the, the, the dirty of the things. And now what happens, you go there, you come out clean, you think that you are doing nice things, but people are getting all of your data. And with this data, they can do like pretty much what they want. Uh, if you ever are curious to open the license, the agreement that you need to sign to use these social networks, you're going to see crazy things. So uh, I was reading recently the one from Threads. Threads, competitor of Twitter, now with 100 million users in, more, in, in less than a week. They claim and you sign for it that they can collect any kind of data about you, including your searches for medical things, for places that you want to go, places that you visit, things that you buy, everything. And they claim that they can use it to train algorithms. And you sign it without knowing. Who here reads these terms of use? Probably one, two. <laughs> And if you tell men, some people that you do that, they're going to call you crazy. But actually, you are the guy that uh, is concerned with reality. So social networks, it's like a serious uh, uh, place that you can mine these things. So indeed, there is a book that I recommend you to, to read. It's called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And it discusses exactly this from Zoshana Zubo. And uh, she is a great scholar uh, working on this like for more than 20 years. And she puts a lot of the problems like on the table to be discussed. Yeah, I don't want to repeat the, what you said because it's absolutely correct. Uh, but I, I just want to um, talk about something that is related that you mentioned, which is uh, which is the data. So the current paradigm everybody knows nowadays of artificial intelligence is uh, that you need uh, data to train the artificial intelligence, and you need a lot of data. Uh, so one of the reasons uh, you have just a few companies that uh, uh, that are really the leading actors of that is because it really re requires access to a lot of data. Well, you know, 
I don't know how many of you have an iPhone in your pocket. I'm one of them at least. Uh, and uh, if you count the number of data that we are uh, we are we are we are sharing with uh, uh, with these companies, it's, it's just uh, mind blowing. And it's not for nothing that Google and uh, Apple and uh, Microsoft and a lot of other um, big big actors you mentioned uh, they give you free calendar because they want to know where you are. Right? Uh, they will give you free email because you want to check what you, you say. <laughs> and they, of course, that's why all these things are free. Yeah, there is this joke that says when you receive a, a product that is free uh, and you wonder why, then why? Well, you are paying with your data for it, not with mine. So, so data is basically the oil, right? For these, for at least the current paradigm of AI, um, and that's why. Um, uh, we have this. Now, there is a new paradigm that is going to come sooner or later. Uh, and that paradigm doesn't need uh, input from only humans. Uh, let's not forget every nice pictures that uh, Anderson showed you, there was a human behind it. Okay? It didn't happen out of the blue. Somebody asked you, somebody prompted by providing a request. So there was always a human. And a lot of data that was used to make the system capable of generating the pictures came from our pictures, things that we shared uh, with social networks, with, uh, uh, with the, the cloud services that sometimes are not even open, but somehow uh, some company, they think they can use it. Right? There were some news about that just a few days ago. Uh, so um, currently, Artificial intelligence, so if you are into the Hollywood movies, they're not gonna kill humans, okay? That's for sure, because the artificial intelligence with the current paradigm needs humans to generate data for it, to train, okay? It cannot train itself by generating its own data and then retraining itself. That, that's not a viable solution. So, but the humans generate the data because they have sensors, and they have also their own artificial intelligence and they create something and then they feed it into the AI, right? So it is pre-processed. There will be a day sooner or later that is artificial intelligence system will have their own sensors. They are starting, right? So there's a lot of IoT happening. There's a lot of data that is being gathered without any human intervention, et cetera. At some point, these systems might become also autonomous and that would be a very, very interesting, actually, paradigm shift. Nobody really knows when it will be the case and what will be the consequences of that. But we shouldn't lose that perspective because if we really too much concentrate on what is the current paradigm, paradigms in technology come and surprise you very quickly. The artificial intelligence GPT, chat GPT, is a good example of that, right? When did it, when did you hear first time about that? Probably in November when chat GPT announced that it exists and uh, let people you, uh, play with it, right? Not even a year. So, so let's not forget also next paradigms. These are very important. Uh, and in that next paradigm, I'm not sure um, how these very large companies that are currently dominant in AI will be, they have definitely the means, right? But one of the biggest assets that they have, which is access to the human generated data will become less relevant. Before uh, giving a, uh, uh, for the floor to ask questions, I, I just wanted to maybe highlight one point you, you spoke about, six US companies, three Chinese companies, and uh, are managing this uh, data for, for uh, AI. That means there's a lot of blind spots. I mean, from uh, uh, minorities, different type of uh, communities that are not uh, in part of these data. And uh, that might also uh, change uh, the outputs, results. Even when you do a Google search, for example, could you please well, tell a few words about that? And after we have some questions. 
a very important uh, question. We have basically um, two big paradigms in, in machine learning. One is what happens basically in the decade from 10 to 20, 2010 to 2020, in which we had a revolution, so to say, in terms of like the quality of discriminative machine learning. So separating A from B, C from D, classification. Uh, and then for, for that part of things, you, you need a lot of labeled data. And labeled data is, uh, it comes with lots of problems. Biases is just one of them. So if you have uh, a system to recognize faces, and if you train with labels of like um, most of the people in the database is uh, white, so you're gonna have a system that's pretty good to recognize white people. And it's gonna be terrible, might be terrible for other ethnicities, especially minorities. So when you have a system that's like um, uh, designed to do separation, you really need to think about what's the kind of labeled data that you use. The problem is, with this, it also exists with the second paradigm, is generative AI. So generative AI, you don't actually use explicitly labels done by humans. Why? Because when you have, for instance, a piece of text, what you try to learn is what comes next. So you start with a sentence, then you hide a piece of the sentence and you try to predict what's coming next. So it, this is the way that it gives labels to itself, right? The problem is if most of the text that is available, most of the data that's available is also like biased, the generative AI that you're gonna create is also gonna be biased. And then when you go to the direction of uh, what Raj mentioned, if you create these algorithms that can train itself, they can train themselves and then they feed themselves, suppose that this is possible. So they are gonna keep doing this loop and improving for one part and discriminating the other part. Right, so that's uh, why I I was saying that I really think that we need to work in four directions. Uh, we need to have investigations and research to identify these kind of things. It's not about identifying just fakes. So you can develop detectors for biases. We have like many social scientists and uh, 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 people from the humanities working on trying to identify biases. So this, this, this is the first thing. The, the studies, the research. The second, you need some regulation. Third, you need some standardization as well. So this can help you uh, to, when you are gonna release a new product that you take decisions about humans, you need to have some like a set of rules. So you need to have like a, uh, the performance needs to be on pair for different minorities. Uh, if you are gonna design a system to decide on low ones for people, you cannot like discriminate for this minority that group person specific. And you need education. People need to know that these kind of decisions might be biased. So this is the kind of problem that I think that we really have with AI. It's not about like Hollywood taking over the world. Uh, and, and most of people just want to discuss that, okay? And uh, most of the questions that I go to for interviews, they, oh, when uh, we're gonna be eliminated? <laughs> that doesn't make sense, right? Uh, we should discuss the here and now. And the here and now is like uh, the problems that we had in the past that are being exacerbated, like uh, prejudice, discrimination, and all of those things. Yeah, I don't have anything to add, really. We just said maybe develop a little bit more on the standardization thing that you said, um, and also regula regulations. Um, you know, there is a third concept that I would like to also bring in is that. Um, I guess everybody agrees that these large companies, the six plus three that uh, Anderson mentioned, they cannot be left to, to, to regulate themselves, right? So they, they, there must be other incentives for them. Google, it's over 10 years, they took even do not do no evil out of its, uh, yeah, out of its motto. Uh, the motto. Uh, motto, yeah. So, um, uh, so, so you need regulations, uh, but regulations, cannot be too specific, right? A regulation cannot say, Google do this mm. on a daily basis. So it can be just very high level and very, uh, some to some extent, even abstract. So how do you really go from regulations to getting these companies to really follow the spirit of regulation? This happens through two steps. 
And that's not only in AI, it has been in the history of, um, of, uh, of technology, the same approach. We haven't really fundamentally changed. You need standards and you need certification, right? So these companies, they cannot sell products and services if they have not been certified. Now you could have auto certification, you could have third party certification for all sorts of, but you know, you, you know that no, no equipment that you have, your mobile phones, your laptops, any, any equipment, it is certified, right? They usually have a CE or some Swiss S plus on them. These are certif certificate because either the company itself went through a process to auto certificate or ask somebody to certificate them. And then they receive that label. That is good enough for a while, then they have to do it again, okay? Certification is very important. And then behind certification, for certification is in standards. Yeah? When you say, well, you know, a car uh, should not emit more than this or that much CO2, how do you measure it? You need standards. Because otherwise every company, they do it their own way. Some they take maybe the easy road and find a methodology that, uh, that, that, that tends to be much less emission. And another one maybe is more honest and, and takes more. So you need, you need for certification standards. So these, these three are very, very important. Legislation cannot be too micromanaging and too precise. Number two, legislations need certification. That's the way the companies are forced to obey the laws through that those certification. And for certification, you need standards. Just to add one thing. Suppose that you go to a supermarket and suppose that you buy, you want to buy a blender. So would you buy a blender that comes saying, this blender works 80% of the times. If you try to put milk on it, it will refuse to work. And if you want to make juice, it only works uh, if these and that condition are met. You don't buy it, I'm sure. But then now go for an algorithm. You buy the algorithm and you know that the, that algorithm works 80% of the times, the accuracy would be 80 something. And you know that it can be like biased uh, against some situation and you still buy it. You are more lenient with software, with computer related solutions. Why? Why are we lenient with technology like software, but we are not with technology like things that we buy normally day to day. So this is why it's important to have these regulations, certifications, discussions, technological education, because I'm sure that if you start thinking as we think for the physical things, these companies like Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, Meta, everything, they would not do the things that they do because we would demand much more information for the actions. We are just letting them to do it. Thank you, Anderson. Thank you too much. Uh, well, we talked also about uh, uh, literacy and uh, uh, media education, uh, AI education. Um, well, maybe I have a question to the floor. Uh, who who uh, thinks uh, is uh, already uh, uh, enough uh, prepared to live in this world and knows about the uh, AI ecosystem? Or does training in, uh, in, in institutes about AI for uh, schools or? You know? No? At, at what, what, what level? No. Well, not, uh, not what, what I did is the um, national data system in the course. So I know about AI, but I don't get prepared for any of something else. Okay. Mm. I, I know how it, how it works, but that's it. Mm. I can't anticipate anything. And your colleague? No, I, I don't really know.
there any question for our speakers or guests? Sorry? There is one on that. Yeah. Do you want me to take it? Yeah. Give you the microphone. Do you think it's possible to detect any generated image regardless of the different generated models currently available? No, the question, any generated images. And this goes in the direction that I was saying before, some spectacular things. So the any is a spectacular word, right? So nobody in the good state of mind would say yes, because it's really impossible to detect all kinds of fakes. And uh, I, I might even don't know the kind of generator that was used. So. What we try to do is to detect some traces that we observed in the past that uh, were left by this kind of generators. And the call for action of this talk and, and the take home lesson today is exactly this. Um, we need education because the detectors quickly become obsolete. Technology is like this. It's a cat and mouse game. So I developed this pretty good detector, so to say, and then in two months, it might be defeated by the new family of methods of generators, especially because we are talking about uh, an unfair dispute here. People developing the detectors are like professors, <laughs> are scientists, and they just have like students working with them. There is no company developing this detector. And if there is, they are small. But who is developing the technology behind like these very good generators? At least some of the big nine. And then some of these models will be available and some rogue party can get this and improve independently or, or change it independently. And so it's, it's a game that we are going to be behind by definition in terms of technological development. So what else can we do? Then it comes regulation, education, and everything. So you need all of these forms to work together. So no, we cannot detect anything. We can detect some things. Let me just, uh, so actually this is an excellent question. And I personally have a very, very extreme uh, position on that. Uh, we have never been able to detect um, practically for good reasons. Uh, uh, deep fakes and synthetic media, and it will never be, and it will get worse and worse and worse. So you use the right word, a uh, cat and mouse problem. You know, when the first deep fakes came, uh, whoever created it forgot to make the uh, avatar blink. Mm -hmm. So a very simple detector was just detect blink. Yep. If there is a blink, or if there is rather no blink, it's fake. Then later on, of course, you know, whoever generated it said, oh, the detector said blink, so I'm going to artificially create blinks. This way, uh, the detector couldn't detect. Then later on, in fact, uh, about a year ago, uh, Intel, to not give its name, they made fanfares everywhere in the news. Oh, we have a new detector uh, that is great and it works well, very well. We are going to extract from the very, very small nuances of the of the uh, color of the face of people, whether uh, what is the heart rate, and if you can detect it, it's uh, real. And if you uh, and they, you know, Google search it you know, for news, you will see they they said, but you know what? The first thing that people who were making the uh, deep fakes, they artificially generated very very small changes in the in the thing so that it really creates. So this is this approach is called generative adversarial method. So whatever signature you will have, uh, right? Anything you touch leaves a, a trace, but you can nothing um, prevents you to remove it <laughs> after you've done it. That is also possible. So, so, so these approaches don't work. Now the question is: Is it all hopeless? No, it's not hopeless. We have to find a way to go out of this cat and mouse, because cat and mouse is not only that it doesn't work. It's that the majority of the uh, damage 
that is caused usually by deep fakes and synthetic media, if you are talking about disinformation, disinformation, uh, etc., happens in the first hours or days. So if, if somebody comes in with a new way of generating a content that can uh, remove all the, uh, can, 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 can pass all the, all the detectors, of course, um, you could develop another detector maybe later on, but it's too late. So by the time you develop the detector, the damage has been caused. So we need, for all these reasons, a different paradigm. It's different paradigm people are working on. It's not that magical, by the way. It's called provenance, meaning that you have to sign and inform with some metadata, because metadata is easier to protect than than an image or, or, or a more generic content. And basically start from the journey, from the day the content was created until the day it's been consumed, just give the information what happens to this content, right? This is called provenance. In fact, JPEG uh, uh, standardization company is working on that. There will be a standard for images that will be available starting um, um, uh, starting the um, uh, February, uh, uh, April, 2024, uh, the nice uh, Adobe product uh, that, uh, that uh, Anderson showed you is going to adopt it. The Adobe is part of it. They know that you know this creates problems. They have their own property solution for now, but they are working with JPEG to actually make sure that the JPEG trust um, will, be, uh, will be used in, in their use case, but there are a lot of other people. And there is nothing magical about it. Just it's very simple. If something doesn't have the provenance information, you should not believe it. It's that simple, okay? Anything that doesn't have signature, don't believe it. Anything that has signature, it doesn't mean you have to believe, but there are trust models. You can decide whether you want to believe it or not. But it will tell you oh, this image was generated by, I don't know, the, 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 the Russian, uh, uh, center for whatever, uh, well, you could say, I don't trust them, but some other people might say, oh, I trust them, right? But it gives and it puts the burden on the, on the end users to decide what they trust, what they don't, which is exactly how we do in real life, right? In real life, some people we trust, some people we don't. And some other people is the other way around. Thank you. Well, problems signature in uh, uh, sourcing was one of the main uh, uh, preoccupation of investigative journalists uh, since the beginning of the war against Ukraine. How to to uh, fight back against uh, deep fakes? Well, what at what time did one picture uh, uh, post for the first time on the internet, and uh, how to to uh, I would say. Uh, that trace, how yeah. to trace. They, trace yeah, exactly. so that, that's exactly yeah, so. The, exactly, so the, the technology exists already. Even legislations exist. You know, today is possible by the Swiss, European, and many developed country laws to sign electronically a document. So you don't need to go and put a pink uh, a, 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 a pen and, and sign it by hand. The law allows in Switzerland, Europe, and probably Brazil and the U United States and a lot of European and other countries, these tools exist. The tools exist to digitally sign. Legislation even exists. What doesn't exist is a standard. Because if everybody does it their own way, well, it's a big mess. Mm -hmm. So we need a standard. That's, that's the reason why JPEG Trust is being developed. You need a standard. And the more widely that standard is used, the better. So JPEG is quite well placed because not only a lot of these fake things are have to do with images, so you know, JPEG is about images, but also it is well placed because it's international. So no single entity or country controls JPEG. Every decision is made by consensus and any change or any extension has to go through consensus. And every country, no matter how large or small uh, they are, have one vote. In the good spirit of ISO, ISO, right? That is a Greek word for equal. 
Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, thank you for a very good talk and good strong discussion. And I, I was, I'm um, specifically impressed that you are emphasizing the part of collective action and education because right now I'm working on that part. So thank you as well. So I have many questions, but I will be brief and choose only one. Is there any interesting educational practice outside of technicals uh, domain that people will? do to counter this uh, wave, if you have any, I think that comes in mind, or in terms of standardization, because you have some experience, how some challenges were faced and result or not result. So if you can share some personal experience, that would be very good. So, you know, uh, when I'm asked and since deep fakes, you know, deep fakes were a little bit more popular than, than AI a little bit earlier. Um, uh, when when deep fakes started and people asked me what are the challenges to face with this, I was always giving an answer saying there are three challenges. Technology, but that's the least challenge. Legislation, that's the second. And the most challenge is education or in French formation. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, it's the most challenging, and it is not enough being done. That's, that's my short answer to you, and I'm very glad that people are looking into that now, because it's very important, and it's not only a question of uh, informing and educating el uh, elderly or people who are more vulnerable to these things. It's not only a question of um, educating children. There are no curriculum uh, for kids all sorts of things, use computers, et cetera, et cetera. But actually AI and the impact of AI and, uh, is, 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 is not as much emphasized, but it's a question of actually informing everybody, including professionals, including journalists, including um, every, every basically level and every uh, role in society. This is not being opportunity done enough. And this is the biggest challenge, in my opinion, personally. I completely agree uh, with that. And even in universities, uh, probably you still don't have like uh, disciplines or classes at FFL to discuss like uh, political impacts, social impacts, philosophical impacts, or environmental impacts of AI, right? So these things are happening here and now. Uh, in our case, we didn't have, so I propose it, and uh, the first one will be given in October. I will teach it, uh, and um, but unfortunately, this is gonna be like 150 students at most, so it's uh, just a few. Um, I think that really to change that view, we need to invest a lot in education. And one good example that I have about it that I read is in the Scandinavian countries. So I read recently that uh, the three uh, key countries there, they are introducing to K-12, uh, children uh, of 12 years old and uh, older, um, notions of uh, tech impact. So it's not only about AI, but everything related to the technology. So they are teaching children since K-12 uh, to live with this kind of technology. Um, especially because, uh, think about this, people are saying all the time that AI is a danger, right? But of course it's not. When we really discuss it, we see that it's a matter of understanding, it's mathematics, and then you go for the real problems. But if you go online today, and if you want to buy a kit to edit genes, it's 200 euros. And with that kit of 200 euros, you can breed a rat, a mouse at home that will glow in the dark using genes of a firefly, 200 euros. So do you really believe that AI is a bigger problem that people working in that home, in their homes, editing DNA and mixing things up 
This is what we have now, but imagine in one, two, three years when they start mixing bacteria or some viruses. So this is really the threat. So that's why I started here today with five technologies that are evolving pretty much together. And they are called um, exponential technologies. And when all of them evolve, they keep improving and accelerating each other. So that's why it's called the convergence revolution. Biotech is one of them. IoT, nanotech, robotics, and AI. When you talk about any of them, you need to talk about the five. So the threat is way more complicated than thinking about AI dominating. And we need to discuss not just the education for technology. We need to educate people to start pressing governments to have legislation against this kind of thing. Why on earth are you going to sell a kit to edit molecules, virus, bacteria? And nobody is talking about um, putting guardrails on that. They don't discuss it. Right. Just, just to add, because you know, I think that we have to also define what we mean by education. I want to tell you what I mean by education. Uh, you know, I guess everybody agrees that AI is a very powerful technology, right? I don't think anybody would say no. Yes. There are a lot of powerful devices and technologies that exist, have existed in the history. One that everybody is familiar with nowadays is cars, right? Vehicles, right? Whether electric or not, doesn't matter. This is a very powerful device based on very powerful technology. And like AI, it can do a lot of good things, and it can do also a lot of damage. How do we need to resolve that? We did just didn't say just go and buy a car and just go and drive it. We educated people, and until they don't get educated and they prove that they have reached the level of expertise, expertise that is needed for it, they are not allowed to drive a car. Same is with AI. I think that this is the mindset. When I say education, not just you know making advertisements or telling if you like it or not, come and hear, you know, listen, we're all nice to each other. No, it should be really done in the proper way and it should be done in an effective way, meaning that it should be the same way you for many, many powerful uh, devices and technologies until you don't have the expertise and the proven certificate for it, you are not a lot use that technology, same should happen for AI. Now, again, I'm not for a police state or anything like that, but education should lean towards something like that, not just nicely do things and hope for the best. Okay, thank you. Uh, so education and, uh, to obtain a license in order to use an AI, we'll finish on, on that word. Uh, we're running out of time, so uh, uh, to close the session, uh, I propose a big applause to Anderson and to Raj. Thank you for paying attention. Munir, if you want to say something. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank um, you all, guys. Yeah. Thank you.